Welcome to Undisputed, a Norton Rose Fulbright podcast. I'm Ted Brook. And I'm Aaron Brown. We're excited to be hosting this special mini series to unpack the findings of our firm's annual litigation trends report. For 19 years, our firm's research has tracked changes and trends defining the litigation landscape, from dispute types and exposure to litigation preparedness and in house legal staffing by surveying legal professionals at organizations of all sizes across key commercial sectors in Canada and the U.S. In Undisputed, we'll explore the emerging trends and insights concerning the litigation challenges industry leaders are facing in 2024. Hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Undisputed. Today, we are talking about ESG risk and litigation. So that's environmental, social, and governance risk. And we're joined, Aaron and I, by Alison Babbitt and Heidi Reinhardt. Alison, Heidi, welcome to the show. Hi there. Hi, guys. Alison is a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright and co head of our Canadian Responsible Business and Sustainability Practice. Alison is based in our Ottawa office, which is great for me because I get to see her all the time. And Heidi is a partner and a key member of our Canadian Special Situations team, which focuses on shareholder activist and defense mandates, as well as complex and contested transactions, and is based in Toronto. We're excited. Welcome to our little virtual studio. Alison, why don't you start us off by telling us just a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the firm's responsible business and sustainability practice, what that means and sort of what sort of lawyers fit within that team. Great question, because the ESG aspect of it isn't an obvious one. For me, just to give a little bit of background on me, I am a projects lawyer, and so I assist clients on all nature of matters in the renewables, clean tech, and and mining industry. So that's really where I focus the bulk of my time. And with my role as co-head of our responsible business and a sustainability team, I'm also dealing with a number of ESG-related mandates. It's really important to understand that our ESG or sustainability team is a global team. And it's really important that I think that's the basis on which we approach the type of advice that we give because these types of risks are very global in nature and, and apply globally to clients uh, all over the world. We have folks that deal in this from a regulatory perspective, from a corporate commercial perspective, from a banking and financial institutions perspective. Obviously, human rights is a huge component of this. We have securities matters that come to the fore in the CSG space as well. And of course, very much subject matter close to your heart and Erin's heart, litigation risk is also a huge part of the ESG story. And so we have a number of practitioners very active in that space as well. Just to pick up on that, Alison, like you're not a litigation lawyer yourself, but we wanted to speak to you about ESG because it is, for me, one of those practice areas where there's so much going on geographically. So globally, things are are connected, but then also practice groups, the issues that our clients are dealing with don't squarely fit within the scope of one specific type of service and without spillover. I think that's exactly right. And I always find it interesting when we get asked the question, how many ESG lawyers do you have? And I always say we have 4,000 lawyers in the firm. And so we have about 4,000 ESG lawyers because really we all have our own individual practice areas where we we're dealing with day to day and ESG touches on really almost all of them. And I think that's part of the key for us as a global firm. Not only do we have this expertise across the whole of Canada, but to the extent we have clients who have an interest or an issue in, say, EMEA, then we also have the same skill set and complement of lawyers in that jurisdiction as well and, and other parts of the globe. That's so interesting, Alison. And I think you hit the nail square on the head when you said we all touch this a little bit. And on that note, Heidi, you also do a lot of work in the ESG space, but from a completely different angle. So can you tell us a little bit about your special situations practice and how that touches the ESG landscape? Sure. So my practice is corporate securities, generally speaking. And then ESG shows up in our special situations work where you've got shareholder proposals being made to companies. I see it in the day-to-day life of a public company in terms of what it discloses, 
And again, maybe the risk associated with those disclosures from a regulatory perspective, class action perspective, I think, as Allison said, this issue is a global issue and Canada in some respects is not as far along as some other jurisdictions. So I think the potential for litigation or regulatory consequences is just being felt out. We're sort of getting a sense of where those things might be going. So for me, companies are asking, how do I make sure I protect against that? What rules do I have to follow? What happens if I'm operating in different jurisdictions? How do I make sure people are buying into what I'm saying and and I'm saying the right things? And then you get into the E and the S and the G part of it, which we're seeing growth really in the environmental area in terms of regulatory requirements. But the social has been around already for a bit. And I think people sometimes forget that, that we public companies disclose about diversity, gender-based diversity in particular. And the governance piece is something we do as well, where what is your board What's its process to make decisions? How is it engaging in shareholders? So as much as this is a new issue, it's something we've already been helping companies with in ways they may not even realize. Um, and so I, picking up on that, Heidi, you say that Canada, it's becoming more of a, or, or, or maybe you said it was a little bit behind some some other jurisdictions in its development as an issue for public companies, also as a kind of a practice area for people doing work in that space. It's a nice segue to the report because One of the things that jumped out for me in the 2024 litigation trend survey was this pretty strong finding that ESG issues are a growing litigation concern for in-house counsel. One in 10 respondents experienced some type of ESG-related risk or problem last year compared to just 2% reporting in 2022. So that's a big jump. And I'm just curious, I'll throw it over to, to you or Allison. Is that growing concern identified in the report consistent with what you're seeing or your teams are seeing in 2023 and so far in 2024? Yeah, I'm happy to start and then have Allison jump in. So yes, I think counsel, in-house counsel is paying attention to the risk here and what might be a growing risk in terms of litigation. And I think that's because we see this sort of move towards creating regulatory regime or rigor around this. To get ahead of that, I think people are trying to anticipate what are we already disclosing and how do we make sure that is accurate. We know the regulators are looking at this and if regulators are looking at it, shareholders are looking at it and there's a risk there. Did you have adequate disclosure? Did you have misrepresentations? And we've seen, we're already seeing a bit in Canada that certain people are trying to bring those claims then it doesn't have to be public companies either. Any disclosure you're putting out there as a company, I think people are now looking at closely, is it your advertising? There's the greenwashing concept of we're an ESG aware company, we're making these commitments, but are you actually carrying out those commitments or is that was that just used for promotional purposes? Diversity washing is the same concept. Like we're committed to having diverse workforces, but what are you doing to make that happen? You can't put claims out there if they're not true. So I see a a real focus of counsel to pay attention to these issues because I think we're building towards people starting to say, we have to hold you accountable for what you're saying. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. I think one of the key areas where I think we're seeing a lot more movement and clients asking questions is also just really in relation to the more developed European standards for disclosure that have been very much in the press of late. There has been quite a bit of movement with the CSRD and the CSRD. And some folks on this podcast may be saying, why are you guys talking about European standards for a Canadian company? What what does that have to do with anything? But they do have some extraterritorial reach and it may impact Canadian companies who have that nexus to the EU. We have had clients reaching out and saying, can you help us join the dots? Are we caught? What do we do? And of course, fortunately, we have our colleagues in in EMEA who are able to assist with that. And I think that type of growing body of change in EU is really starting to move the dial somewhat in North America, and particularly in Canada, as Heidi says. We're seeing much more of that movement towards broader disclosure, more transparent disclosure, and consistent disclosure across the globe, and also moving from that voluntary model into a mandatory model. 
I think the other place that we're, as I look at this more globally and, and I look at it as a horizon scanning exercise, what I'm hearing from our global litigation colleagues is that we're definitely seeing an uptick in some of those novel claims, those novel ESG claims. And we've all seen some of the successes, particularly from the Dutch courts, that have been quite high profile. And really, it remains to be seen whether those lower court decisions will make their way into higher courts. But certainly, with that uptick in litigation we're seeing globally and NGOs and other parties willing to take forward these types of actions. That's so interesting, Alison. I think there's so much to unpack in what you just said. I'm excited to unpack it as the conversation evolves. But you talked a lot about the EU and how there's a lot of trends in terms of reporting obligations and also some cases that are happening in Europe. Where does Canada fit into that trend? The anti-ESG sentiment I think we're all talking about here is some of that regulatory pushback we've seen in the U.S., in certain states in the U.S., certainly how one determines financial risk for investments and whether or not ESG should be a factor in that determination. And I think we're seeing less of that anti-ESG sentiment in Canada, at least from a regulatory perspective. I I don't think we're seeing that same pushback. And there may be pockets of that sentiment in parts of the country, depending on industry type. But from a regulatory perspective, what we're seeing is we're really seeing that move from the more voluntary disclosure regimes and the voluntary guidance like TCFD and and the like, moving into that more mandatory disclosure type in a way that we hadn't seen before. And modern slavery is another good example of that, where we've moved into uh, a mandatory disclosure regime, really a mandatory reporting regime. And that's really part of Canada responding to the international commitments that it has made. So I expect that trend will continue. Allison, so far I, I've counted three acronyms from you so far that I had no idea what they mean. Latest one was TF's, TF. I don't want to quiz you on it and, or even learn <laughs> necessarily what they all mean. But at a high level, is it fair to say that the acronyms are shifting from a sort of voluntary buy-in sort of regulatory requirement space in Canada towards what I understood you say to be a more mandatory regime? more akin to what maybe EMEA has had for and a speaking of, of time. acronyms, EMEA is one that everybody everyone knows may EMEA. not. I do, do they? I don't know. <laughs> Europe. Should have said Europe. I don't know. <laughs> Listeners, can you Europe please and, hang uh, Ted if you don't know what EMEA ma- meant? Ma- and like a good portion of the world in addition. yeah, Middle East yeah. and Africa. Yeah. As we look at ESG and sustainability from a North American perspective, it's certainly very clear that in Europe, regulators are further ahead than where we are. And there's been a lot of push from a European perspective to ensure that the energy transition and to help businesses maintain a level of disclosure that is fair and transparent and similar across the board. And so over time, that has, we started with voluntary disclosure like the TCFD, so the Task Force and Climate-Related Disclosures. And that has moved into a regime which has become much more mandatory in nature from a European perspective. So as we move that over to Canada, in Canada, from a, a disclosure perspective, we're certainly living in a world right now where we're relying on voluntary regimes for the most part. There are some required disclosures from a materiality perspective for public companies. But in terms of actual ESG mandatory disclosures, these don't exist right now. But we're starting to see a move towards that. And so as not to throw any more acronyms at you, safe to say that Globally, I think we're trying to move towards a set of standards where everyone can rely. And so we have a set of compliant, fair standards where everyone will follow so that your stakeholder, your investor doesn't need to guess what each different standard means. 
we're trying to move to a place where we are complying with the same set of standards. And so necessarily that means that a mandatory regime is likely to come. And I think we're seeing some movement on that in Canada right now. Interesting. And I I imagine that a double-edged sword. On one hand, you have some mandatory requirements under, under jurisdictions with standards like that. But the uniformity could create certainty and at least you know what the landscape is going to be. Heidi, do you have any thoughts on the sort of anti-ESG mm-hmm. findings in the report and, and whether they have been popping up at all in the Canadian side mm-hmm. of the border? In Canada, I mean, we're a different culture from all the states where I think you see a lot more of some of this litigation on the people challenging what might be affirmative action policies and things of that nature. I think in Canada, I wouldn't call our anti-ESG movement to consider it to be as strong as maybe you see in some other places. But I think we've got maybe more of what I would call an ESG questioning or desire to say, is this effective? Does this work for our Canadian landscape? So for example, our regulators are trying to introduce generic or general disclosure requirements for public companies, and they put it out for comment, whether it's climate-related They've recently proposed diversity-related disclosure requirements. And I think what we're seeing is a healthy sort of back and forth with the regulators to say, does this make sense in the Canadian landscape? Is this going to be good disclosure? Is this worthwhile disclosure? And a lot of it is disclosure-based as opposed to like quota-based or to create an obligation to do certain things. But I do think there's a bit of a push and pull to say, are we thinking about what this really means for a company? And I think that's a bit more of the Canadian approach. And Heidi, do you, Um, I don't know, have you seen characteristics of companies involved in this, this push and pull? Is it issuers questioning the value or is it activists or special vehicle sort of uh, stakeholders that are getting involved? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's both. We've got a wide range of companies here in Canada. You've got your bigger companies that attract institutional investors. Institutional investors are more likely to want this information, use this information when they do an investment, whereas maybe a smaller company isn't attracting that capital and might say, this doesn't make sense for me. I don't have this in my industry. This will become a challenge for me. So we are seeing a sort of a, a difference between who embraces some of this and maybe who says, does this actually make sense? And I think on that investor piece, that's where we might see some challenges arising as well, where people have an investment thesis based on ESG-related criteria. And there may be investors within that investment entity that say, but where's the return? Like, do these criteria translate into Uh, what you're saying it should. And if it didn't, why not? And if you're taking sort of my investment money, you know, most people want to make sure that money is put to good use and and turns into a return. So I think all these things will get fleshed out as as this sort of develops to say, again, this almost goes back to the greenwashing. Like you can have these criteria, these philosophies, but if they're not performing, at what point do you sort of revisit them? And Heidi, we've talked a lot about ESG as sort of a nice term to to reflect the three different groups, but they are distinct things. And the litigation trend survey broke down where specifically in-house counsel are seeing the most potential. And it flows by the order of the acronym. So environmental is the biggest area expected to drive disputes, followed by social, followed by governance. Is that and like quite quite a significant disparity? 71% for environmental down to 26% for governance. Is that reflective of what you're seeing as well? I certainly think there's a focus on environmental right now and climate. I think to some extent, maybe more so than the S and maybe more so than the G, there's a bit of a tangibility to the E. Like you can measure things, you can report data and numbers. It's a little bit easier for people to wrap their heads around I'm going to get down to this level of emissions in 20 years. Did you or didn't you? Are you on the path to doing that? I think people find that a little bit easier to digest, which also then makes it a little bit riskier that people can look at your own information and say, well, you said this, and I'm not seeing that translate into something. I'm challenging you now on that. And that's super interesting because I practice a lot in the space of competition, and we're definitely seeing movement on greenwashing. 
We've seen a lot of greenwashing cases by the Competition Bureau and investigations over the last couple of years on things like whether coffee pods are actually recyclable in the way that they've said they are. But what's really interesting is there are some proposed changes coming down the pipe, not yet implemented, not yet uh, received royal assent, that would actually add a specific pro- a specific provision to the Competition Act on making claims to the public on the environmental and ecological effects of climate change, and specifically whether that's backed up by an adequate and proper test. And then as part of the changes, we're also seeing an ability for increased private applications to the competition tribunal to challenge. So, you know, in the past, the Competition Bureau would be the one leading investigations and we're more and more seeing this ability for Mm -hmm. private applicants to actually directly challenge from a sort of deceptive marketing standpoint. So I think what I'm seeing in my practice, to our point earlier about how we're all doing a part of this ESG, is really following the trends that you're both talking about, that we're seeing increased provisions from regulators, increased focus on the E, particularly in ESG, and a lot around the environment and ecological effects specifically. So, Mm -hmm. And that actually brings up something I think Alex and I were chatting about before, which is that to your point about maybe creating this new private right, like there are new avenues, I think, that are coming up for people to make complaints or to bring an issue to to someone's attention to maybe do something about it. And Alice and I forget the name of the ombudsman, but you were mentioning there's a sort of another role that oversees these things or provides a a way for someone to raise a, a complaint. And I think that is another challenge for companies because the landscape is evolving. And we, I think you're, there, all, there could be new ways all the time that someone can, can come after you for what you've said or done. And um, I think that we have to keep, a hit, you know, keep an eye on that as well. Is it the Canadian ombudsperson for responsible enterprise maybe that you were? Yeah, yes, exactly. We were just having a conversation about that earlier, just to, to Heidi's point that as much as that that ombuds office arguably lacks some teeth because they're really they don't have enforcement powers per se. That's exactly what I was uh, going to ask. Okay, and just to explain that the core, the Canadian Ombuds Person for Responsible oh, another Enterprise, acronym. yeah, another acronym. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, just to keep you on your toes. They review complaints about potential or possible human rights abuses that are alleged to have been done by Canadian companies outside of Canada. They focus actually on three core industries, so garments, textiles, mining, and then oil and gas. And so it allows individuals, corporations to make a complaint to say, we think there has been some forced labor in that particular area. The core then has an opportunity to investigate that. Businesses can participate in that or not participate in that as they wish. But at the end of the day, if a resolution cannot be found to the particular issue at hand, then there is a huge reputational risk for a company receiving not only a complaint of this type of forced labor or human right abuse, but also if they've been found to be a violator, then reputationally that's hugely damaging for them. And then, of course, there's the potential for litigation that might flow from that. So as much as an organization, it it may lack, lack some power to really do much in relation to the types of decisions that it makes, it's certainly an area, I think, where companies who have operations outside of Canada in those core industries are taking some notice. Yeah, and my head was going to the exact place that yours was, Allison, that even if this doesn't have teeth from what we would traditionally refer to in an enforcement perspective, this could well be what's keeping GCs up at night because of the potential for reputational harm to the business. And maybe just to add to that, some of these are all just strings too that people start to tug on. And if you are an activist looking at a company, this becomes the fodder to say, okay, maybe the ombudsman isn't going to bring a billion dollar claim against someone. The activists will look for any means to say, this builds our case that this company has a problem. And I think that just adds Questioning to judgment of management and the board because- Exactly. Of, yeah. And it's a little bit of a waterfall effect that we've got an issue here. Interesting. So in, in environmental is big. I think it's front of mind for a lot of, of the respondents. Certainly a lot of the public is just more aware 
the sort of novel lawsuits that Allison's referred to and the impacts of climate change are front of mind for a lot of people. But the S in ESG, I just want to pause there for a moment and see if you could offer any insights as to what those sorts of risks look like. You know, when we talk about the social risk, I actually think a lot of of folks just say, what does that even mean? And to Heidi's point, the social aspects of this have been around for a long time. We've been talking about diversity for for decades and what that looks like from, say, a board perspective for public companies and the diversity of, of women on the board. And I think as a country, we have a history of trying to protect human rights that apply to all of us and all of our businesses. We're protecting the rights of workers based on the Canadian legislation that's out there, making sure people have safe working conditions. They have the ability to take breaks and go home at night. There's already a a lot of legislation that's in place to protect that. I think during COVID, necessarily, there was a lot more rhetoric around social risk and social rights. And that, I think that term social risk became a bit more known during that time. And people became a lot more aware of the type of social pressures and social risks that we have. In Canada right now, obviously, the modern slavery risk and this idea of protecting against forced and child labor is just very front and center right now because of a new piece of legislation that was enacted and came into force on the 1st of January this year. And that is requiring businesses who meet the test, at least for the act, to have to report on the type of what we describe as modern slavery risks, but it's it's a risk of child and forced labor in their supply chains and reporting on the type of risk mitigation that they take in an effort to eradicate, at least reduce or mitigate that risk, not just in, in Canada, but globally. So I do think we're seeing much more emphasis given on certain social risks, we maybe just don't call them that. And that goes along as well with our discussion of core, right? And and looking at responsible business throughout the supply chain. And Heidi, and maybe this is a question more for you, but what about the G? Yeah, I think it is a little bit of really trying to understand risks, which is always can be a challenge for the board and for management in terms of paying attention to Things that may have been around for a while, like climate, but how does that impact our business? And how does the idea that there could be an actual financial outcome from something? So I'm thinking about things like we've seen different weather patterns and how does that impact your business if there's a likelihood of flooding somewhere? It's a challenge for boards sometimes to understand these issues because they can be complex. I think the G1 is really just about trying to stay on top of stuff and be open to knowing what you need to know about this. Maybe you don't know exactly what that means, but like trying to figure out how to respond to it. And then before we talk a little bit more about how to be prepared, the litigation trend survey also breaks down concern areas by sector. And obviously, energy has ranked ESG as a primary concern for obvious reasons. But one that's a little bit less obvious maybe is financial services. Is there something specific to financial services that would be driving an increased ESG focus moving forward? And and this could be in the U.S. or Canada. Maybe this is more of a U.S.-specific trend. But is there anything in the financial services sector specifically happening around ESG that you think may be driving that industry specifically to be a little bit, have these concerns more front of mind? I think a lot of it is that activists have been turning their sights on financial institutions from a funding perspective. So who, how are you deploying your capital? Where is that going? I think that's a part of that now focus on the financial services industry. So it may not be their own particular business, like in terms of what they themselves do, but what their clients are doing, which is almost akin a bit to the modern slavery approach now. Who are you doing business with and coming at it from that perspective? That makes sense. And also a highly regulated industry and an industry where statements and representations and reporting happens. Enormous amount happens, right? So one of my takeaways from this conversation is that there's increased pressure, whether it's pressure from consumers or pressure from regulators to make statements and to report about ESG matters. But then that also carries risk if you're not doing what you're saying 
that you intend to do or if you're not measuring how you're going about doing it. I think that's a really nice way of summarizing some of the things that we've talked about, Ted. So what do we do, Alice and Heidi? If you, a general counsel comes to you, they're losing sleep because their management is saying, what's our ESG plan? How are you managing risks? Um, Is there any sort of guidance or, I don't know, like standardized directions that you can turn to? At least find some comfort. We are doing X, Y, Z. And it may not be perfect, but it's a start. I think the star is picking up the phone to us. And Heidi talked about the governance side of things, starting with that framework of how do I feel about these risks? What is my what does my business see as the risks? What do I want to do about them? What's my stance? And understanding what your framework is, what your appetite for risk is really important. So once you've made that that policy, you've delivered that message, it's then a, a somewhat easier task to then determine, okay, who's going to be responsible for each individual risk? Whose responsibility is it going to be to manage that, to ensure that whatever our policy is gets dropped down to the right teams and is managed in the appropriate way, is monitored in the appropriate way, is audited in the appropriate way, and ensuring that information can make its way back up to the board so they have the information to make the key decisions that they have. So for me, it really starts with that very strong governance piece. We'll start a business in good stead to then be nimble, to be able to respond to the issues that that come along. Once you have that framework, it's a, a case of working through what risks are in your business, what mitigation steps make sense for you as a business. What do you see as the risk coming down the pipe? What's that horizon scanning looking like? Because I'm sure GCs all across the country, a huge part of the role is saying, what's coming next? How can I best protect the business on a go forward basis? And if you can be ready and have the governance structure, the tools and the people that you need to help you in place, that that makes you much more nimble to be able to really cater to those risk factors as they come along. There's no silver bullet, right? It's not like here is the program that I implement because it depends on your business, your industry, your market, your past practices. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Heidi, any other words of wisdom you you would throw in? Well, I was just some Thinking along those lines, I have sympathy for GCs because this is a complex area. And I think that certainly from a disclosure sort of regulatory perspective, when things are changing and evolving and rules haven't come into effect, but you're already disclosing things, that can be a challenge. But I think to your point, I would also say to clients and companies, don't be too hard on yourself. Like it doesn't have to be perfection. I think a lot of times even the regulators have said, try and be reasonable, like at least get going, get going and it can evolve as much as the landscape is evolving. Compliance can be evolving as well. So I think allow for that and also look for the opportunity. Like I think a lot of this, we're talking about risk, but sometimes these are opportunities too. And there can be just simple things that you can do as an organization to maybe promote an element of ESG. And as Allison said, you can call us and we can talk to you about that as well. But just don't be afraid to just start and kind of see where where it takes you. Doing something is often better than doing nothing. But yeah, I think you yeah. also made a point, Heidi, in one of our discussions before the recording about being consistent. I do think exactly as we're figuring out what the landscape looks like from a disclosure regulatory perspective, I think it doesn't hurt even now to be looking internally and creating controls and processes to say, we do want our messaging to be consistent. You want to make sure that I think internally you've got some checks and balances to say, do we know what we're saying? Have we checked what we're saying? Are we saying the same? Awesome. Thank you, Allison. And thank you, Heidi. Like this has been a great conversation and it's a topic that I care about because I deal a little bit with the E of ESG in in some of my environmental litigation and contamination cases, but I don't get to see the full picture very often because I'm just focused in that single lane. But I appreciated this. 
Yeah. And I think we probably just scratched the surface of all of the potential ESG stuff out there. But it was a very interesting discussion and learning about what you're seeing, especially for us as litigators to see what our business colleagues are seeing on the horizon, I think can help us to prepare for what litigation may come of some of those things. So thank you both for taking the time to chat with us today. Thanks for having us on, guys. A lot of fun. Thank you. Here's what I'm taking from ESG is like you won't get in trouble for what you don't say, but now you have to say things. And so people are getting in trouble and there's more risk. And I think it's a good thing, right? I think that in in a lot of sectors, mandatory or at least standardized, even if not mandatory reporting requirements can make sense because it creates some certainty. It creates some consistency to this is what we have to do. It's not a guessing game. We're not trying to play to consumers or play to markets. We're making particular statements and we're doing particular investigations and then we're measuring how we're accomplishing those goals. And I think the other point for me is accuracy and to Heidi's point, consistency. If you take the modern slavery reporting legislation, for example, the real thing right now is just be accurate. Don't try to be aspirational and say something that you're not doing. You just have to be reporting on what you're doing. You could theoretically say, I haven't done anything, (laughs) and they can't do anything about that at this point. But the point is that the bigger consequence legally would come from saying something inaccurate than saying nothing at all. And same with greenwashing. Like, once you say something, it has to be accurate. So I agree. I think that is the takeaway of this discussion is like accuracy and consistency. Make sure that what you're saying is accurate. If you're going to say something, if you have to say something or if you want to say something because you want to promote a certain aspect of your product, just really make sure that it is accurate and be consistent in the way that you describe it in your advertising materials and your disclosure. Yeah. yeah so I think I like accuracy. I, I like, I'm going to add a third one. So accuracy, consistency, but then timeliness. So revisit your statements, right? If you've said something seven years ago about your carbon footprint reduction plan, are you revisiting it? Because maybe it's no, yeah. if it's no longer accurate. Yeah, if you said 2030 and then a whole bunch of stumbling of blocks yeah, came up. It, it, yeah, and it's still then, out there as a disclosure. But you yeah. know what? That just plays into accuracy. So I think that you're right. Accuracy and consistency lessons for today. I like it. And I appreciated both Heidi and Allison talking, illuminating the G of ESG for me a little bit, right? It's more about the framework, identifying teams, having monitoring, reporting, auditing, responsibility, delineate it for all aspects of your business. And then that makes you like a more nimble, effective organization for responding on these issues. Anyways, that was a fantastic conversation. What are we doing next? We've done the report at a high level with FDP. We did cybersecurity with Imran and John. John and Imran. And ESG. I think that you know, Heidi's conversation around securities and special situations, I think I think that's an area we maybe need to dive into a little bit more because I think, you know, it's something that we often see as being less of a litigation topic, but I think I think there's a lot happening, a lot happening there. And we need to uh, I think we should should do our fourth episode on that. I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Undisputed, a disputed spinoff. To learn more and download our 2024 Litigation Trends Survey, visit litigationtrends.com or visit the link in our show notes. And you can subscribe to Disputed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts currently so that you won't miss any of our episodes.